I now have a great pleasure in um, inviting Ambassador Lalit uh, Manse, former Foreign Secretary. He will be speaking about interfaith dialogue and harmony. You have the floor. According to Buddhist theology, the Bodhisattva is a spiritually evolved being who has, through his karma, received nirvana, that is, an exemption from the cycles of birth and rebirth. Yet, the Bodhisattva is one who voluntarily forgoes nirvana in order to take life again on the earth, in order to serve humanity. For nearly 600 years, the Dalai Lamas have lived on earth as a reincarnation of the Bodhisattva of compassion, of Avalokiteshvara. And each one of them has come to life with a certain mission to help humanity. So the question is, what has been the mission of His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, during his current incarnation? The answer has been provided by himself. He has said that he has three prominent commitments in life. One, as a human being, one of the seven billion inhabitants of the earth. Um, and like each one of them, he aspires to happiness. He wants to promote human values like compassion, tolerance, and forgiveness so that people can reduce their suffering and lead happier lives. Well, it is assumed that this is the natural role of religions, of all religions. However, the Dalai Lama has also recognized that there is a growing population of people who don't believe in religion, those who are atheists, or they don't subscribe to any established faith. So his prescription is that the solution lies in what he calls secular ethics, not necessarily religious. That was the first level. At a second level, the Dalai Lama calls himself a Buddhist leader. And his mission is to promote, promote the message of the Buddha based on the core values of compassion and nonviolence. And finally, at a third level, he is the Dalai Lama, the spiritual leader of six million Tibetans whose, uh, whose cultural, human, and religious rights continue to be denied under a brutal regime. So these are the three levels at which the Dalai Lama has identified himself. And therefore, he has defined his own mission in this incarnation. But all these three levels sort of merge seamlessly in the person of the Dalai Lama. Imagine that he became the leader of the Tibetans at the age of four when he was enthroned. He faced attacks on Lhasa at the age of 11 when he was in charge of Tibet. And imagine that at the age of 15, he was negotiating with the Chinese leaders like Mao Tse Tung, for the future of his people. So the Dalai Lama has in fact been the face of Tibet, and he has been the international face of the tragedy of Tibet. And yet, as a Buddhist, he has restrained his supporters. He has restrained them for using violence against the occupiers or expressing hatred against them. That is the greatness of the man. Now, the Dalai Lama is not recognized as the head of Buddhism internationally, because there is no recognized head of Buddhism. But he has also been careful in taking interest in Buddhism while not stepping into the, the landmines that infest the international politics of Buddhism. I'll give you a small uh, instance. Uh, a couple of years ago, when I was the vice president of the Mahabuddhi Society, I went to the Dalai Lama with what I thought 
was a very bright proposal. And I suggested to His Holiness that he might take on the initiative to bring the diverse groups of Buddhism in India together on a common platform. Because you know that the followers of Buddhism in India today, from the Theravada tradition or the Mahayana tradition, or even the people who are called the neo Buddhists, they somehow don't see eye to eye with each other. And I thought, who better than the Dalai Lama to use his, his, his authority and his persuasive powers to bring them together? So the Dalai Lama's response was very typical. With his sort of staccato laughter, he said that he had already tried it. <laughs> he said he had tried it and he got them together, but finally he had to give it up because the group started quarreling with each other so violently, he didn't think it was worthwhile pursuing this idea. So I got the message, fine, let Buddhism remain as it is, let the leadership remain. Getting the Buddhists together on the same platform was not a priority. So I asked the question, what was the Dalai Lama's priority? And the answer, I think, is in his identification as one of the seven billion people on this planet. Now, Buddhism describes every human being as a transient being. And so everybody is transient, everybody comes and goes. But they also go through endless cycles of births and rebirths, and therefore they need to be helped in order to get themselves released from this cycle. So if you think that there is some magic formula which will bring happiness to people, there is none. The world is not very different from the time when Gautam Buddha first preached the precepts of Buddhism. But there can be an effort to reduce human misery. And I think this is what the priority of the Dalai Lama is. According to him, the 20th century was a century of bloodshed during which more than 200 million people died as a result of violence. So the 21st century is also witnessing a continuation of violence with perhaps greater ferocity. The cure against violence, according to the Dalai Lama, has to be with the basic principles that the Buddha had taught. It has to start with the individual. It has to begin with respect for other people's interests and their different ways of life. The Dalai Lama feels that there is a need to reconnect what, what he calls the deeper inner values of every individual. Now, His Holiness recognizes that all the world's religions subscribe to the basic human values, the basic inner values. The paradox is that religious leaders, for their selfish interests, often create violence. They don't reduce them. So, the Dalai Lama has taken the initiative to convene interfaith dialogues where spiritual leaders are urged to find a common ground of core values and become active in restraining violence, especially amongst the supporters. On 20th and 21st September last year, the Dalai Lama hosted a unique event in Delhi called a Meeting of Diverse Spiritual Traditions in India. Every known faith in the world was represented in that gathering. And I was privileged to be the master of ceremonies there. <clears throat> it is only the Dalai Lama who can inject a sense of humor into the most profound and serious issues affecting humanity. So in the course of his short discourse, the Dalai Lama talked about the state of the world, the state of misery, the prevalence of violence, and what needs to be done. But he also urged the religious leaders there to speak with complete sincerity, seriousness, and transparency. And at that point, as an example, he pointed to somebody sitting in the audience and said, everybody should be like him. And he pointed to the Jain leader, Tarun Sagarji Maharaj, who, in the best traditions of his faith, was sitting there stark naked. 
So the, uh, that, that was, wasn't taken amiss by anybody. The Dalai Lama, what you are saying is, be transparent, be truthful, be serious. Don't have any inhibitions. Then the Dalai Lama teased these religious leaders and urged them to come out of their comfort zones and work at creating a better world. And this is what he said. So my spiritual brothers here, here you are with your flowing hair and your prominent beards. And then he said, please think seriously about it and be more active. That was the message he gave them. The prime example of what the Dalai Lama calls secular ethics is India. He said India is the only country in the world where all the world's major religions live together. They have lived together for more than a thousand years. So I think if you're looking for what is the priority of the Dalai Lama in this incarnation, this is his priority. How to reduce misery in the world and how to address the problem of violence. And so the, the goal that he has maintained in his life is interfaith, dialogue, and harmony. And this is where he's expending a lot of his energy. As he said at that gathering, all our different religions who are presumed to practice karuna should now join in an effort to make this century a century of peace, a century of compassion. Well, I know that on his 80th birthday, many of you as supporters and well-wishers and admirers of the Dalai Lama are worried about his mortality. But let me give you the cheerful news that he himself is not giving up that easily. And this is what he said at the conclusion of the interfaith gathering. And I'm quoting him. I'm now 80 years old, and I will spend the rest of my life, say 10, 15, 20 years, dedicated to serve humanity. That was the reason why he has taken this incarnation. And then he said, if my knee gives me some problems, it does not matter, as long as my brain works and my voice is okay. I'll be able to come, even in a wheelchair, and carry on talking, blah, 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 he said. <laughs> this, this is the message, the birthday message, if you please, of the Dalai Lama in his own inimitable words. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me, on behalf of all of you, uh, let us all wish His Holiness the Dalai Lama an active brain, strong knees, a clear voice, and, and much strength to his elbows for the next 20 years and more. Thank you. Um, I now have a great pleasure in giving the floor to Ambassador Shiv Shankar Menon, who has a very close personal uh, link with uh, Tibet and with Dalai Lama. I think he spent some of his early years in, in Tibet. I've been asked to speak on leadership and vision, which is rather like gilding the lily. Uh, but if you go to a New Delhi bookshop today, you'll see f bookshelves full of books telling you how to be a leader, the habits, the, the ways, even the tricks of a successful leader in business, in your career, in every material field. And frankly, it's depressing. I mean, we seem to have devalued, uh, maybe trivialized the idea of leadership, of what a leader is, and we've made it commonplace. But true leadership is truly a rare thing. And it shines even more brightly when it has no position, no power, and no pelf. We in India are really fortunate because we have a living reminder among us of what true leadership is, of what it can be, 
and what it should be. For me, a true example of leadership is His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama. Here is someone without an army, without a government, or wealth, in exile from his own land, and yet he is much more than just the most powerful refugee in the world. He is a spiritual leader who is not confined to one religion or faith or to matters of religion. He has global influence, and his words and his actions inspire people across the world. So how is this so? Shah mentioned that I've been privileged that His Holiness has been a presence in my life uh, since I was five. And my appreciation and understanding of him has, has grown slowly. It obviously has a long way to go and to grow in the future. But it's a measure of his greatness that he can communicate with all of us at any age. Uh, whether or not we belong to a faith or a religion, no matter what our beliefs, our education, our predilections. And I've often wondered, what is it that enables him to work as he does, and at so many levels and in so many ways? As one of the world's premier spiritual leaders, he has kept Tibetan identity and culture alive in the world's consciousness, and he has consistently sought to find peaceful and harmonious solutions to the political vicissitudes that have affected him and his people. And yet, he will tell you he is only a simple Buddhist monk. And he will lay much greater store by his contributions to keeping alive the long tradition of Buddhist practice, of science and philosophy, and the Tibetan culture with which it is so intimately interwoven rather than all the titles and the honors that the world has bestowed on him. And it is as a Buddhist monk that he behaves with all the rigor, the discipline that it entails. And perhaps that is one of the keys to understanding the phenomenon that is the global influence and leadership of the 14th Dalai Lama. He is always true to himself to his own calling, to the middle path, to compassion for all beings, including those who oppose or vilify him. And this credibility has been maintained in good times and bad when he was in Tibet since he came to India in 59, no matter how the world and things around him have changed. And this is truly an extraordinary record of self-imposed discipline, of selflessness, of, of annihilation of the ego. The other unique aspect that, for me at least, of his leadership has been the sheer rationality and logic with which he analyzes issues and problems and speaks of them. I mean, the long tradition of Buddhist philosophy, which Geshe just mentioned, which has so highly developed logic and reasoning, bears fruit today in his teachings. But most significant of all for someone like me, uh, has been his vision of an ethical and compassionate world and his unremitting commitment to that ideal. His belief in peace and nonviolence has been maintained even in the face of violence and the suffering of his people. He argues logically that violence can only achieve certain short-term ends but cannot attain long-lasting ends. To paraphrase what he says, violence begets violence. We cannot predict the outcome of violence, nor can we be sure of its justness at the outset. The only certainty is that where there is violence, there is always and inevitably suffering. To those who accuse him of being naive, he says, and I quote, it is far more naive to suppose that human created problems which lead to violence can ever be solved by conflict. And how true that is. Peace is not just an absence of war, but a state of tranquility founded on a deep sense of security that arises from mutual understanding, tolerance of others' points of view, and respect for their rights. <clears throat> Many centuries ago, the Buddha said that the only real victory 
is one in which all are equally victorious and there is defeat for no one. We live today in an interdependent world where the only peace it is meaningful to speak of is really world peace. In today's world, that is the only practical victory. Any other way will lead to disaster. His Holiness reminds us in his actions and words of the continuing truth of what the Buddha said. It is a lesson that those who consider themselves leaders should heed. And finally, I do think that the best way of celebrating his 80th birthday and honoring the example of true leadership that he has set to us would be really for us to rededicate ourselves to his purposes. I don't think we should leave it just to him and the next 10, 15, 20 years to do the things that he has dedicated himself to do that Lalit Man Singh just mentioned. So I, I do hope that you will join me in that, in rededicating ourselves to the purposes for which he has devoted his life. Thank you.